Welcome back to another episode of Born Again Bowhunting Podcast. On this week's episode, we got Christopher here, and we're going to be do- talking a little bit of uh, summertime scouting to get you ready for deer season. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. We found out you're on vacation and you're still willing <laughs> to podcast with us, so we really appreciate that. <laughs> White Tails 365, boys. I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. If, you, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, Chris's face is a little red, and uh, <laughs> he, he claims that he got attacked by the sun today. So. <laughs> well, yeah. It's, uh, it's rough down here in Virginia. It was kind of funny because I've been outside with my shirt off all year trying to sort of prepare for this. Yeah. And I was like, I'll go an hour, hour and a half, get a little, get that good tan. Yep. And then I'll have the wife put the sunscreen on and we'll be golden. Not even kind of close. <laughs> I'm probably going to be golden at some point, but for now it is lobster red. <laughs> the sun's a different animal at the beach. I, I can is. attest. I got sun poisoning and this is no joke. Like I got legit sun poisoning uh, two or three years ago when we went to a family vacation on the beach and it is a nightmare. Like itchy <laughs> is all get out. Like, the most intense pain. It feels like a bunch of needles just going into your back. Oh, yeah. I, ever since then, no, no thanks. No thanks. No, nope. no thanks. <laughs> the sun and me, no, 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 no. But well, yeah, it's rough. But yeah, we want to say thank you for having a, or, or excuse me, we want to say thank you for coming on. We did not realize that you were on vacation, yeah. and just uh, the fact right. that you are scheduling this with us just shows how much that you actually care about hunting and how much of a passion it is. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that. yeah. Why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Well, my name is Christopher Leppert. Um, I love, love, love white tails. Uh, I was a private land guy for years, uh, had farms, you know, just like a lot of guys do they grow up and they have xyz farms that they're able to hunt and um i got so sick and tired of the whole waiting for deer to daylight and sitting over corn piles and you name it so i decided to make the switch to public land and i pretty much got sat on my ass for a couple of years and uh ate a couple buck tags here in ohio um was fortunate enough to take a nice piebald 10 point um, down in Kentucky on opening day in 2019. But after that, um, which, you know, to kind of back up a little bit, I guess I took 171 inch 14 on private in Ohio Ooh. in 2018. Oh, and we said, let's, uh, let's do this public land thing. And man, you talk about a, a wake up call. Um, I was not, as good a hunter as I wasn't even close to as good as I thought I was. So was very fortunate and blessed to meet some of the people that I have that have shown me how to scout in places, you know, going in blind and um, just being able to read the land and really kind of getting back to our roots a little bit back to the tribal days, if you will. Um, And it's been a it's been a long road learning all that stuff, but now it's it's really starting to kind of turn the other direction, and I feel really confident in it. So that's just a little bit about me. I, I love deer hunting. I'm I'm a I probably like turkey hunting more than I like deer hunting. If I'm being honest, that's I'm a, a I'm a turkey bold, bold nut statement. job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, absolutely in love with scouting deer, probably more than killing them, and it's really cool to me. So, yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Awesome. So let's get into this. Yeah. Yeah. So I would agree. Like if you go from private to public, it's a, you kind of have to forget what you know and start fresh because it's a totally different game. Yeah. And I, I I feel like everybody has to have a humbling (laughs) moment in their hunting career because the story that you told is probably very similar to a lot of people. You know, they, yeah. they have the same, you know, grandpa's got a farm that I've hunted for so long. I've killed X, Y, and Z buck. Grandpa sells the farm. Now, you know, I think I'm a macho hunter, but now, you know, and, and it's, it's if you have that humbling experience, like, like you were talking about, and, and you rise above that, 
you just you become a cone or excuse me you become a cold stone killer yeah and i believe that yeah i i mean you just turn into a killer and and that's honestly that's that's what you need you need that humbling experience and and uh, we've been seeing you kind of on social media a little bit and uh i think you went on um a scouting mission to kentucky with the latitude guys and jake bush yeah Um, yeah you want to touch base on that a little bit Uh, what you're allowed to talk about, I guess. Yeah, we don't want to know oh, locations yeah. or anything like that. You can yeah. drop us pins. Well, after I, the I really like. That's all you ever have to say to me. I love you guys to death. Now, um, <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many people have told me they know where I'm hunting and asked where I'm hunting, and I'm like, you guys are crazy. Um, you know, don't don't ask. That's like asking yeah. somebody for their wife's phone number, yeah, or something. You know, so yeah, just drop um, a pin to those cameras. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. So, um, I have, uh, sort of a friendship relationship, whatever you want to call it with a gentleman by the name of Jake Bush and Corey Godar. And, um, I had a spot that I felt was pretty good and just wanted to kind of share camp with those guys this year and invite them along. So I invited them and in return, I get to go scout with Jake Bush and there, you know, for anybody that knows that guy and follows him with an open mind, I won't say that he's the best out there because I don't know that you can really say that about, I don't think there's a best hunter because you've got like private versus public and then you could go into the, you know, permission versus lease large leases and the private section and then, you know, states and everything with the, um, the public land. So But if I were to pick a person who could go kill a giant, um, like if this is draft day and we're drafting a fantasy team, all my money's going on that guy. He's he's insane. And it's, it's really quite unrealistic, honestly, to ever think that myself or a lot of people are going to do what he's doing because he's a different animal. I think he likes to torture himself. Um, He ran, I saw a story today. The dude ran um, five miles with a seven minute pace in the middle of the day, you know, in like 90 degree heat. And I'm like, this is the mofo that I'm chasing through the damn mountains. (laughs) This is what, like when you see him, my joke, like, oh, you're trying to get the fat guy to fall on film. That's who I'm following over deadfall and up and down and across the hills. So, but um, needless to say, I wanted to go scout together and hunt, uh, you know, share camp. Um, So we made a point for Jake, Corey, my business partner, Josh, uh, Luck, and myself to go spend a weekend down there. And really, you know, if we wanted to talk scouting, man, postseason scouting is, is in my opinion, uh, when people like ourselves anyways kill deer. That's when the deer yep. are dead. They just don't know it yet. Mm-hmm. Yep. You're fine-tuning things and running backup cameras in the summer. So really the, the, the postseason scouting – um, that's where a lot of the groundwork is laid. So you can see so much more and you don't deal with the heat and the bugs and yep. humidity and all that. But, um, essentially we went down there. I want to say we hit probably like 10 to 12 different hub systems and scouted for scrapes and beds and essentially um, you know, the, the first part of that was, you know, we're kind of going at this relatively blind because I had hunted a slightly different way and wasn't doing things how he was. And I wanted to learn what he was doing. So we didn't start out at an elevation. We did all the elevations. We just kept going up and down to try to get the elevation that we needed to be at where we could find bedding. And once we found that elevation, Uh, I was like clockwork, like, Mm -hmm. you know, crazy. And so um, once we kind of figured that out on day one, which I think that was a, that was a 12 mile day on day one. And they're not like, I want to stress this. If you're sitting here watching this on YouTube or listening to it, and you're thinking about that time you did 12 miles on a trail, 
throw that in the trash can. <laughs> this is like deadfall, tiny little like third brick size rocks covered in wet leaves going up and down side hill and your ankles and places that never hurt <laughs> killing you. Yeah. Um, it's, it's basically as close as I've ever gotten to the Western elk you know, that I've done out there. So in Colorado, Chris, so Chris, I have a oh, selfish question real quick. Um, oh, nuts. And, and if, if you can't answer it by all means, but we hunt a lot of big, uh, big timber and big woods as well. And I'm curious, what elevation did you guys find the bedding on? Oh man. Uh, I, I couldn't honestly tell you the number gotcha. that like I, I personally, I'm going to be super real with you. <laughs> I was trying to keep up with Jake and, and Corey, oh, like yeah, those man. guys are taller than me, lanky and everything. Um, I want to say, well, well, if you want to give me one second. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I'm getting at is we went to Indiana last year and hunted, um, some big timber and Kevin and I went scouting and <clears throat> same thing kind of that, that Jake did. We, we started in the bottoms. We just kind of went up to the top and we'd go back to the bottom. We'd go back up the top until we found that sign. And we noticed at least, and I know everything's situational, but we noticed, yes. we noticed that, what was it? About a hundred feet from the top. Yeah. Like, it, like the, the classic three quarters of the way up is where we found all of the sign. And yeah. I was just curious um, if, uh, if that was similar to what, to what you guys were finding. Absolutely. Top third, that top third hard line. Yep. Um, and, and what you find is um, they're, they're just the weirdest. Like sometimes you can see it on the map and other times you really can't, but there's just these little benches. It's, it's yeah, but sometimes it's not even really a bench, um, but you'll see where a tree clearly, you know, a decade or two ago fell over. And then the hole filled back up and that's a flat spot everywhere else is steep, but that, and like, you'll be walking along and you'll see that and buck bed. Like, right. you know, like when you start finding them, you're like, I'll bet I'm going to go pull hair out from yeah, under the leaves. That's a right pro there. tip. That's honestly, that's a good tip. It, it's, it's incredible. Um, so we found a lot of them on benches and, and some of them were a little more than halfway up. Some of them were top third. It just really, this is the crappy part about this because there really isn't a cookie cutter answer to it. Course, and like yeah. I've scouted the hell out of Indiana. And I, so I've scouted Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky this year. And I still have West Virginia to do. And I've got work to do in a few of those states as well before we get there. So thank God some of them open at the end of October, beginning of October. <laughs> but um, yeah. we were, we were roughly... So the beds were, I've got one right here. So you probably about 900 feet roughly. Yeah. So, and you're, you're looking, you know, a lot of the places that you're hunting, um, you know, Eastern Kentucky, Southern and Southeast Ohio, you know, you're looking at like 1200, yep. 1100, 1300 foot elevation at, at the peak. Um, so right around that eight to 900 feet we were finding some beds. We found some lower than that and some higher than that though. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially once we kind of figured things out where we felt like we'd figured it out, then we started doing the easier approach, which was to find the hub scrapes. And for anybody that hasn't done that, it's better than any corn pile you've ever ran. And when I explain it to my friends who still have private parcels, that they're waiting for a deer to daylight. I can't buy a nighttime pick or video. I don't get nighttime, yep. like nothing yeah. ever. And like last year I killed first sit in Ohio and the deer were in broad daylight. Uh, when you're bed hunting, man, it is, it is nice. There yeah. is no, man, I better look at the moon and I better hope that I've got the, if he's if you have the right wind and he's bedded there, which very good chance he is, and you get in there without bumping him, it's over. It's yours to screw up, and you're going to have an encounter more than likely, unless you a did bump him or somebody else bumped him out or something. You know, stuff happens. Mm -hmm. But um, so where were we? We were talking about Kentucky. So we we figured things out. 
and we got into the scrapes and we found scrapes that I'd never seen before in my life. And it's very interesting. We all grow up watching deer make scrapes at the end of October and into November. And then sometimes even in late season, right? You see them pulling it out and they're pissing in it and crapping in it and you name it. There's nothing like that at all. It is 100% licking branch. And oftentimes, like I still have yet to get a video of an older or a younger deer in one of my scrapes that I'm thinking of particularly that paw at the scrape at all. It's 100% about the licking branch. And what, what really sucks about this again, is there's no cookie cutter answer. Mm -hmm. You, you really have to just get out there and put the miles in and dump cams everywhere on these scrapes to figure out what's hot because what we found in Kentucky was completely different from what I have in Southern Ohio. And I think it's population based. So like what I have in Ohio, there's a fair amount of deer uh, in this area. Like I can go see, you know, 50 deer sometimes, you know, in the late season or something. So um, I want to say I saw like 13 on opening day and eight of them were bucks and three of them were shooters. <laughs> um, so these scrapes, you know, in, in, I'll tell you what I've found. And these are like little nerd tidbits. So forgive me if I start, you know, oh, we, my we rocker you just keep throwing them at us. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in the higher population areas, um, myself and some others believe that they're, they're going to be together most days anyway. So they don't feel the need to communicate as much. They'll still hit that scrape, but it's not as aggressive. So like they're literally just touching their lips to it. Uh, they're touching their face to the licking branch. And I, the one that I have, I bent the branch down a little bit and kind of manipulated it to get, cause the branch they were hitting was kind of offset to like the right third of my camera. And I wanted them in the middle. So I bent a branch down and I mean, and it's a beech tree. Um, and immediately these smaller bucks start hitting it. And then the older age class deer start hitting it. And now they hit it every day. I get videos almost every day of at least one of the bigger deer hitting that scrape. And if they're not hitting it, they're 10 yards behind it. Mm -hmm. So then you go into like a mountainous lower deer density place, like where we are or like Southeast Ohio or something. Um, the, the branches are broken. They're, they're chewed on a bunch. There's not many leaves on the licking branches that they're working. And, um, we found one down there that had four branches that were probably about the size of your thumb, roughly, uh, broken, just snapped. And they're just Twisted, hanging yeah. there like that. And they're like, this is like at almost seven feet height that they're broken. So that deer is clearly getting up on his hind legs and yeah. just working the hell out of that branch. Yeah. Um, and you, the other thing that I've noticed and I I've, I've learned this as well from some of the masters like Jake and Troy Pottinger, um, the ground, uh, rather than being pulled out, it'll just be, uh, you can tell that traffic is hitting it, but the ground will be recessed. Mm -hmm. in that area under there and you'll see you'll you'll have the evidence they're not pawing at it it's just from having bucks hit that you know every day every other day whatever it is for you know a decade or more because this hub system sets up for this wind and it doesn't get pressured or you know whatever sets up there's ag at the bottom that they can dump down into uh, which is another interesting theory that i'll get into <laughs> um and, and it just happens year after year after year, every single day, just about. And so you start looking and you're like, wow, the ground is an inch lower right here in this cleared out area. And then everything else is normal and, you know, same elevation, same level or whatever. And there's grass on it and plants growing up. So it's pretty neat. Yeah. Go ahead. I know Jake has talked about before the licking branch being the most important part of a scrape and hanging a camera because he's he's made it sound like you can have the size of a truck hood of dirt pawed up and stuff, but if it doesn't have a good licking branch, you know that that might 
dry up, but he's like, I'll hang my camera over a licking branch over a big scrape any day. But yep. that makes it way tougher to find just a licking branch with, you know, a basketball size, maybe scrape, or like what you're saying, just the ground is lower than everything else too. So oftentimes from what I'm finding, especially where we're from, um, and I'm, man, forgive me because I am still soaking this all in myself and learning as I go to different states and find just the weirdest shit you could ever find. Like Missouri is so incredibly rocky. It, it was so difficult to scout. It just, mm-hmm. everything sets up differently. You you read it differently. Everything's just so different. Um, but the majority of the scrapes that we've found, uh, they're not like any slouch. Like they're truck hood, half the size of a truck. Like they're going to, you're going to notice it. And, mm-hmm. and, like anybody from the Midwest, oh look, a lone beech tree. Yeah, oh, there's a scrape under there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, but what's interesting, and I started to learn this from him, and this, you know, this is another one of those kind of little woods woodsmanship things that you you would have to grab a private land guy by the face and make him watch it, and he still might not believe it. I would laugh at anybody who told me this. Deer only travel quartering into the wind. That's how bucks travel, right? Every deer that I've had an encounter with was wind to back. And it wasn't even, it wasn't even like a necessarily a strong wind. It was just the thermal switch, the thermal pull. So they're coming downhill to hit that scrape, that egg, whatever. And he's got the wind at his back. So you've snuck in there And he can't smell you. So as long as he doesn't get below you and catch your thermals, you're a hundred percent bulletproof at this point. So, yeah, I kind of want to touch base on that a little bit. First question before we get off topic on that, because I can go for a while. First question, real quick answer. What um, height are you finding those those perfect licking branches at? Are we talking like shoulder height or higher, lower? What are you, what are you thinking? Um, so what we're looking for, And, you know, again, it all sets up differently and I can give an example of this. So in Kentucky and in Southern Ohio and, you know, this sort of Midwest area, if you will, right around that shoulder height, head height, um, generally is what we're hoping for. Um, When you see it, when you see a bigger branch snapped, well, they're not even snapped, they're twisted. Yep. Like yep. a little kid was trying to twist the branch yep. off. Yep. Wasn't strong enough. They get caught in their antlers. Um, and while they're working that branch and then they, you know, do their thing. So when you find a bigger branch that's twisted and snapped like that, and it's at six and a half, seven feet high, it's clear that only one animal is doing that. Yeah. And that's like a really big damn deer. Yeah. Um uh, in um and, and this is where kind of reading everything uh, comes into play. So like when you go to Missouri, I, I scouted um, the Ozarks and the Mark Twain. And you talk like a desolate, gigantic place oh, that's just. I've haunted it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. So like rocks everywhere. Yep. I've never, I've hunted the freaking Rocky Mountains and it wasn't that rocky. <laughs> yep. um, it's so rocky that the trees that these deer are working, they pull over. So like I would find trees this big around that are sitting like this. So the licking branch would be four feet off the ground. And at first I'm like, oh, you know, that's just a little deer. Well, as I'm going, I'm finding bigger trees that are pulled over. And I'm like, what in the hell? You know, I've I've been through like three hubs today. I can't buy what I'm supposed to be finding. Yeah, what you're looking for, yeah. And, well, turns out the ground is so rocky that the trees don't root super deep. And you'll find, you walk the ridges and you find, you know, mini sequoia looking red oak trees. You know, they're giant and the root ball runs, you know, a foot deep and they're They've fallen over. Um, and, you know, the the entire root ball is the size of a truck, but it only runs a foot deep. 
And that's where I started really piecing it together. Like, ah, okay, mm-hmm. that's, that's that. But I will say I did like have God smile on me. Uh, there was a vine growing from one cedar to another and a vine that had dropped down from the vine. <laughs> and it was at like the perfect height of like five feet. And I walked up to, I was like, oh my God, it's along an old tractor path that's not <laughs> been mowed or anything. And I, I'm like, yeah, walked over to it and there's a big old, you know, recessed spot. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> this is getting yeah, damn, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's what's funny about all this too. You know, you being a private land guy, having buddies that all think the same way. You're waiting for that deer to daylight. How far, how far are these scrapes from the egg? Two or 300 yards, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, he's just back there doing big buck things and slowly coming in and assessing the situation. And you're sitting out on that field edge or just inside the woods waiting. And it just doesn't work out as to where now, you know, I can go chase him, which is funny. Those, all those scrapes that I found out there are in a hub that dumps into the only, um, like anything close to ag that I could get, which was a private land food plot. Uh, A guy had like a pristine green food plot. um, And this is green in mid-March. So um, I'm like, well, yeah, there's literally nothing else here that would attract them other than their natural brows and hard and soft mast and everything. So um, yeah, ended up finding some really good gold out there. So, you know, you, you got to read the situation, but here in Ohio, six, six or seven feet, yeah. you can pretty much figure that that's probably going to be a pretty good deer, especially yeah, if it's yeah. a, a good branch yeah. as well. Yeah. Everything's situational and there's not, like you were saying earlier, there's not a cookie cutter answer, but I was just curious if you were finding a average height of, of where you were finding those really, really good hub scrapes that you're looking for. Um, because I've noticed that, um, shoulder height or a little bit lower and I'm roughly six foot tall. So roughly around that five foot mark is what I'm finding as well in the, in the big woods. Yep. So I, I feel yep. like that that's a good, for anybody listening to this, that's maybe wanting to hunt big woods or hunt big timber. If you, you find a scrape like that, look for the, the elevation as well mm-hmm. on the licking branch. So yeah. now, so now that we're done with that, I, I wanted to rewind and I want to talk to you about, you were talking about the thermal pull and how big deer will obviously bed, you know, at higher elevations and then drop down in the bottoms with, with that thermal pull kind of at their back. And it kind of goes against the cliche, um, you know, deer won't walk unless there's wind in their face. Now, I will say one thing. I think it's situational as well, because if you hunt, if you hunt farm country, I would disagree with that statement. But yep. if you're talking big timber, I would agree with that statement. So yeah. why don't you talk a little bit about what you've found in that and maybe explain it to the listeners maybe that don't understand the concept or maybe new to the big timber game? Yeah. So before I get into that a little bit, I want you to record what, what the wind is when you, I know you guys are probably junkies like me and drive around in glass deer in the beans right now. Pay attention to what the wind is doing and what side of the field they're on. More often than not, when I find them in our farm country, the wind is blowing from the woods to the field that they're out in. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, kind of sets up similar but it's not but it's not they have they have that sight advantage that is like you know untouchable when you're in a bean field you're not going to sneak up on them out there generally yeah yeah Um, so it's very interesting and too the other thing that's funny on a very very calm day watch watch where a lot of the bigger bucks will hang out they'll be in those little sunken areas ditch lines whatever because all the thermal thermals are pulling down into that and they yeah. can smell the entire field while they feed. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, with the big timber, you know, the hill country, um, oftentimes they're going to bed on the top third. That's not, you know, guaranteed. Some deer do bed with the wind in their face. You know, they have all just like us, everybody's got a different personality, but from what you find, the bigger mature deer, they find things that work and 
how they didn't die yesterday. So they keep, keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll find beds out on those little secondary ridge points or something. And um, oftentimes it'll have cover, but they'll bed with the wind to their back because they have, you know, that thermal pull happens. And so it's pulling the thermals uphill into their nose. They've got a, a, a stiff breeze over their back. So they smell everything behind them and in front of them. And now they have a sight advantage, you know, because they're up at elevation and can see down below them pretty good. So what's really funny that I really keyed in on last year is when you're hunting those pretty good hills. And again, the more steep it is, the more defined everything is. The easier it is to find beds, yep. uh, you know, the easier it is to identify that thermal pool. So like when it's pretty steep, that sun starts going down. It's literally like a really stiff breeze. Mm-hmm. Like the, the air is dumping. And as soon as I feel that, immediately in my mind i'm like okay he like it'll take a second and i'll kind of appreciate the thermal pool for a sec and then i'll be like okay he just stood up he just stood up out of his bed this is when he feels safe he now has a steady consistent advantage to smell everything behind him and he's watched down this way all day long he he just stood up get your bow ready, get the camera on, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. So they'll come down the hill uh, as if they've never been hunted before in their life. And it's, it's the weirdest thing. And Jake describes it this way. And I'm a hundred percent in agreement with him. It's almost like they get these spots and they're generally in places that suck to try to get to. And most people are super intimidated to hunt low because everybody hears about the swirling winds down in those drainages and everything. So they don't get messed with a lot. They might get bumped because everybody's up there on those ridges walking around and they get winded, you know, from 400 yards away, two ridges over and the buck just dumps down and moseys off and you never even knew he was there. Mm -hmm. So they get cocky. And, you know, kind of like you can't kill me. And are, are any of you guys movie guys at all? I mean, kind of, not. I don't, I don't watch a whole lot of TV. But if, if you quoted something, we may know it. Has anybody here seen The Departed? No. No. <laughs> no. The wrong Three guys. guys in a row have not seen The Departed. You're all right. Wrong dudes. Well, this is literally the best way I could describe it. So there's a scene at the end of the movie, um, essentially, where. Uh, one dude's trying to kill another and he's he's waiting for him in his apartment and the guy walks up and jiggles his keys into the door walks in and there's the dude like in scrubs you know covering his hair everything covering all his tracks and he offs him the look on that guy's face uh, he's just like bewildered can't fathom how he got the drop on him Uh that's the look that you get you literally get a look from those deer when you go whack and they <laughs> stop and they're like i don't understand what's happening what do you mean you're here yeah <laughs> you're yeah. not here um so it's it's really incredible um i'll be hunting in the rut and same thing goes for the morning uh, how many times do you see deer at first light versus 9 30 10 10 30 11 i was hunting a spot I have in Kentucky um, where I had, I had tried and tried and tried to convince myself to go. And every time I checked the weather, man, it was a super light and variable wind. And I'm not, I don't like to hunt in a light and variable wind. I, I think of a, you know, a buck lives and dies by his nose and his, his senses basically. And if he can't use his nose, he's not going to go Mm -hmm. trouncing around and finally, it was the last weekend in October, and I'm like, well, dude, you got to go hunt this place sometime. It's damn light and variable every time you look. And this is like, I've checked this place a crap load trying to go all year. And so I got myself to go down, and um, I mean, you could hear 
you know, an acorn drop from 200 yards. It was dead calm. Yep. I get set up. I'm one stick high, uh, about 50 yards below a scrape I'd found. That was pretty good. And um, I didn't see anything all morning. And then I think it was like 10 a.m., you could barely see the the oak leaves start to tremble just slightly and boom five minutes later here come some does with some bucks behind them and then the wind picks up a little more boom there's my first good buck in the morning wind picks up a little more here comes a good one right at me and it like every time <laughs> i'm like wow there's okay there's something to this and i ended up shooting him um, but it was, uh, and that was 11 AM. So it just, the, the thermals, you know, the, and it, it is different in farm country. It's, it sets up completely different. Mm -hmm. Um, but the thermal pool is, is a thing. And it's, I mean, I think you could probably use it, uh, more in any area than you might believe as long as you can kind of read that area. Um, for example, in farm country, sunken areas for me all day those drainage ditches and stuff are like where it kind of sinks down uh you know into the woods or whatever right on the edge of a mm -hmm. field you always notice how the deer come in and out of there they just check the field from there you know they came up there and smelled everything that was in the entire field yeah, yeah, and yeah. has been yeah um, so so that's kind of my theory on some thermals. Rewind a bit, Chris. I'm a, I'm a bit confused, and I want to make sure that we're on the same page. So you said you didn't see any deer until 10 o'clock, and you're saying the wind picked up. Were you meaning the thermals picked up because yeah. the sun came yes. out? Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, the thermals. Yeah. Um, so the thermals started coming up, and because um, I think I think the wind was forecasted to be either three or four miles that day. It wasn't going to be very calm anything yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. And that wasn't going to be until three o'clock or something like that, midday. Gotcha. Um, so once the sun started beating on the, the hillside, um, thermal started to rise and you felt like the deer got a, a lot more comfortable and they were starting to drop down in that bottom. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were side hilling. They were dropping, they were everywhere. Yeah. It was incredible. Gotcha. Um, it, it's crazy. It, it blows your mind when you start, figuring these little things out yeah yes yeah, so, say go somebody ahead. that hasn't really dealt with thermals or like put in a lot of effort to it once you figure it out it totally changes the way it's you a light bulb and yeah and it's so it's so intimidating and it's so like frustrating when you when you don't understand it yeah but, yeah but once that light bulb goes out you just view everything in the woods differently mm -hmm. like you will look at it and you're just like and like the cliche answer is always like well how would water run well until you physically like watch milkweed weed or until you get busted too many times, like <laughs> it's so true. Like just the, the slightest terrain and how everything moves, like there's a reason why those deer are doing that. And that there's a reason why you're getting busted. It's because of that, you know, it's always sinking to the lowest point. So just, you know, keep an eye, pay attention. Where's my scent going? How's it pooling? That's another thing that a lot of people don't realize is I feel, this is my own personal opinion. I feel that your scent will pull as um so for example like uh a bowl you know as you fill it up it comes out the sides and it just fills and fills like smoke for example like sure. if, if you were to use smoke for an example that's a perfect example because visual smoke just doesn't go in one direction and it just stays like one tiny little line smoke goes in one direction it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger well your scent does the same thing mm -hmm. so i mean yep. you got it you got to keep that in mind as well but now, one like you were saying, Kev, once you get that thermal stuff figured out, shoo. Even even you don't even pay attention to the day wind. Sometimes you just no. are like, okay, I'm going in for an evening hunt. I'm the thermals are going to go down here. My day winds might not be perfect for me, but you set up for the thermal pool in the evening, the last little bit of light. Chris, yeah. I am I am a bit curious on your setup. Um, you know the like you you mentioned earlier the cliche. I'm not hunting in the bottom because you know, swirling winds and, and I can, I can be honest and, and I've talked myself out of going down into bottoms before because Same. it's like, well, you know, the wind's going to swirl and like, I'm going to get busted. And, 
So what 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 did your setup look like? How are you how are you not getting winded? I guess is what I'm trying to ask. So so let's try to put it as easy as I can here. Um, so let's say you have a drainage, and the mouth, the opening, if you will, is at the south, and the head, uh, where you know, like the one of the secondary ridges from the mountain yep. is pointed down. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's at the north, so it's pointing south. You've got the mouth of the drainage at the south, and then you've got you know your main ridges on each side of the valley or drainage, if you will, running on each side of you, I come into that mouth. Um, so I would hunt that only on a north wind gotcha. because it's going to blow you out anyway. And you have the thermals working for you too. Yep. Now there's, and Jake's a lot better at this than I'll ever be, but everything of course sets up differently. How steep everything is, how shaded everything is. Mm -hmm. Do you have, you have a bunch of pines. Do you have, um, you know, leafless beech and oak trees, you know, in January, every, you know, how's the sun going to hit it, everything. But um, I'm an early season guy. So I would imagine that there's going to be a solid amount of shade as I walk in. And oftentimes there's a little stream involved and I'm, I'm going right through the stream. I'm walking right through it. I don't care if it gets freaking chest high at one point, I'm staying in the stream. Because yep. my thermals are going to keep dumping behind me mm -hmm. the way the water runs. I'm not leaving any kind of, well, I'm leaving the least amount of scent trail that I can. I believe that a deer could smell that you walked in the water, but not like they would. They're not going to bust you like they would on the ground. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm basically saying that, you know, for this setup, a buck i'm hunting this on a north wind so he's bedded on a south facing slope looking south now that will happen and can happen in early season but a lot of what i'm looking for is something that sets up for a south southwest wind west southwest you know we all know that yeah. that's the those are the stupid winds that we get stuck with often so um, I'm looking at basically the reverse of what I just described. And I'm going to come in from the north with the wind in my face, thermals in my face. And then I'm going to try to stay in the middle where that water is as best I can and keep my thermals from shooting up the hillsides. And then as the sun starts to go down, <clears throat> I'm going to start and I'll stand there and just pop milkweed forever take a couple steps, pop milkweed, pop milkweed. I did that in Ohio last year and it, I guess it worked. I killed the deer. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. it, it was crazy because as far as thermals go, I was just off of those deer. Yep. And then the thermal switched. I'm good on scent. Those deer stand up and come down and it just I can't even believe that it works that way. Sometimes it's yeah. so stupid to me. Um, so I'm pretty much doing that. I'm coming in with the wind and the thermals in my face, basically that way, you know, cause then you're not dealing with the swirling wind. If you were to hunt that same setup that I described on a West wind, well, now you're looking at a swirling That's wind swirling. Yeah. And, and being for anybody listening to this, you guys, myself, Every human being in the world that's dropped milkweed in hill country knows that feeling in their gut where they're like, how the hell am I supposed to hunt? The milkweed literally just went everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell do I do? Yeah. This is actually what simplifies that. You go down there where you have control and, and it's still like, it's not like this is sounding easy, right? It's not easy. Um, there's a lot of scouting involved, wind mapping, stuff like that, learning different things, um, you know, about how the deer are set up. Uh, one thing I learned that I'd never done, Jake's not just looking for where the main buck is bedded. He's looking at doe bedding, the smaller bucks, because he doesn't want to bump them mm -hmm. on the way in. He wants to avoid them so that way they don't bump and then blow out the big deer or at least put them on alert. And then have them, you know, stand up and stay 30 yards from their bed until dark. Yeah. So one thing that just came to my mind and, you know, 
I started hunting two sticks high, let's say like 15 foot and lower and every situation is different. But I started, I started only carrying, I hunt out of a saddle. So I only would carry two sticks and aider and my platform. And one thing that hit me was a lot of your high end guys, um, especially the mobile hunters, they always talk about not getting very high in the tree. And one thing that hit me when you were talking was, do you think that the height of your stand location has a lot to do with the amount of thermal pull that you are getting? So for example, like if you were down in that bottom and you were four or five sticks high, thinking like some guys, oh, you got to get 20, 30 foot in the air. Well, in my opinion, your thermals would be going everywhere. I mean, I mean, they have the opportunity to go up, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, before that drop. But if you're a foot, if excuse me, if you're three foot off the ground or say six foot off the ground or 10 foot off the ground, the likelihood of your scent just getting sucked down that stream or sucked down to lower elevations is probably a lot greater. I think you basically hit it on the head. So like where guys do hunt soup, you know, 30 feet high and they don't get winded, that's because they're higher than everybody else when you're down in that bottom, my goal is to stay low, dark, and cool. Yep. Because then I know that my thermals are pulling with what's set up in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I shouldn't have to worry. So 100%, you basically nailed it. And I've actually never even thought of that before. Um, I've, you know, I've never thought of the opposite of it. I've just always thought like, if I go one or two sticks, I'll be closer to that creek the air is going to be cooler. I'll catch that flow more than I will say, you know, when I'm up higher, but I've never even, I've never really thought about the high. I've only ever just yeah. thought about the one side of it, which mm -hmm. a lot of what I do is water access and I'll be five or 10 steps from a Creek river, you, you name it. And I think that's you the that's literally the, have the best scent control of your life. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, I think I think that water access is kind of becoming like, and I'm not saying this like obviously you've been doing it for some time, but water access is coming like popular on social media. Oh, but yeah. what I'm getting is. at is I believe that if you don't utilize water access by kayaking or canoeing upstream or whatever, dumping your kayak and then going ten yards and climbing up a tree, I what in my mind, why I use the water access because you're one thousand percent because like that's why you want to use the water access is so that you eliminate any factors of scent. So those guys that are water accessing in and then hiking a mile, like what's the point? You know, it, literally that you just laid ground scent everywhere. Yeah, and I, I look, I get really nerdy when I start thinking about my ground scent. I'm scared to death to take a step because what you can't undo it. Yeah. You know, like your scent might dissipate, but the ground, the ground disturbance isn't going away for a long time. And I don't want to have to deal with that. So I don't want some nanny biatch <laughs> to cross <laughs> yeah. my trail yeah. and blow my entire life. We've all, um, we've all been there. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> they, they get an arrow. You start blowing and you're going to catch one to the chest. <laughs> so, but yeah, a hundred percent. I, I get why it's kind of a fad, just kind of like saddles. You look cool when you're taking the drop shot and that, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. looks cool. Yeah, yeah. But the, the water access to me is a hundred percent about being able to control my, my scent and use the thermals and everything. And then access a way that, that people probably aren't. Yeah. Um, but I, I get it too. I mean, bucks look good in a kayak oh. or canoe. Oh. <laughs> I can't. Hello, John boat. I can't Maybe. wait. So we've we've got a uh, we, we're going to Indiana. Um, okay. Uh, late October for like uh, I don't want to call it a public land challenge and like knock off THP, but it basically it's like a small YouTube group, bunch of guys going and uh, there's a spot yeah. <laughs> that we all are very familiar with that I cannot wait to just kayak a big old just gnarly sucker <laughs> out of there. I am so pumped. That'd be cool. I, I think I watched some of your. Do you guys go with the Simon Brothers? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, so, yeah. I think I watched some of your guys' stuff last year. I think Luke killed or Isaac, Isaac no, killed. Isaac, yeah. Isaac, Isaac killed. It was Isaac? Kevin uh, killed, and then I stuck one, and we couldn't find him. 
Ah. And then uh, that was it, that right? Was it that other group? Yep. The other group didn't shoot an arrow, but yeah, that it was that is time. um that's fun, man. Indiana last year, um, was one of my favorite things I've ever done. Yep, ours so as well. I killed first sit in Ohio. Uh, six sits later, I killed in Kentucky, <laughs> and then I went on public land basically blind in Indiana. So I drove up on Saturday, I want to say November 5th. I killed the last weekend in October in Kentucky. And I, I was like, Oh, you could, you could go tomorrow, you know, on yeah, yeah. the 30th or whatever it was Hunt Halloween, and, and, and kill one and be done before November. And I was like, <laughs> no. And to give you an idea, that was, that was the suck dude. I arrowed that deer at 11 AM. I got to my truck at 7:22 at night with my deer and all my gear from from a kayak. Did you, so, oh, from your kayak. Gotcha. Yeah, I so I kayaked across the lake, walked up a mountain and then scouted my way in. And it dude, <laughs> that was a that was a lot of work. I <laughs> I had a 98 pound pack on the way out cuz I packed the deer and everything out. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. With my stuff. So, um so, uh, I went to Indiana the following weekend, drove up and just scouted the parking lot and saw if I could glass some deer, um, stuff like, you know, checked out the surrounding ag. And when I pulled in at 7.30 a.m. on Saturday, November 5th, and didn't see anybody in the parking lot, I was like, all right, we got our spot, boys. Game we got on, them. yeah. We got them. <laughs> And and then I'm driving home and I'm like, because it's super flat. I don't do a lot of flatland stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's just vast. Goes on forever. I'm like, what in the hell am I going to do? So then I, I game plan with my buddies. And this is during, you guys probably remember, this was during the warm up. It was like yeah, 80, yeah. 85 yeah. degrees. Yeah. All yeah. the deer had dug holes and yeah. left the earth. Because we had that cold front like the third week of October. And yep. then the last part of October was starting to warm up, and then the first week in November was like mm-hmm. 80 degrees. Yeah. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, it was hot. <laughs> so I go in there, and I got my first spot set up. We had a south wind. I set up along a river on the north side of the property, hoping to catch a buck cruising that hard edge, checking the entire woods with his nose efficiently. And I saw three bucks and a doe but nothing with any size. So sat there till noon, got down, just sat there, drank some water, ate some lunch, got a game plan, went to the South side of the property to scout the the edge of the ag. Couldn't find anything. So I went up into the oxbow that I'd originally wanted to get to, but it was just too far. I mean, I would have had to wake up. I think I got up that morning at 2 AM to make the drive and get there. And I just, I didn't have it in me to walk, you know, wake up the extra yeah. half hour or yeah. whatever. So I'm cruising up into this oxbow. Boom. Jump a big buck up with two does. See another big buck later on. And then um, I get set up. And I had a big doe come in. And I'd put toe and heat piss all around this scrape. I left this part out. I apologize. I found a scrape. Found the buck's bed with the doe beds. Found the scrape. They're, you know, 40 yards apart. And then there was a huge pin oak tree, uh, like the size of my truck, basically. Well, half of my truck dropping, just raining acorns. I'm like, okay, well, here we go. We're not going to yeah. find anything better than this. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. This, is, this is where they were for a reason. So let's, you know, maybe we'll bump and dump one. Sure as shit. <laughs> I get up, I one sticked up the tree. Uh, I think I made like three moves. I was like probably 16 feet, 17 feet, something like that. And the doe came in, smelled the doe and heat, went back the way she came. Didn't want anything to do with that. And then last light as I'm like, should I pack up now and Mm kind of get a little head start? And I'm like, well, I know what that is. Turn the camera on. (laughs) on." And watching him try to work. Yeah. Watching him try to work that scent out. He was trying to, he was catching the thermals off of that super light and variable he was catching the thermals and he just kept going back and forth 
trying to cut a track. And finally, it was just like, screw it. And he just walked right over to the scrape and just took it in <laughs> and then walked right right up to me at 21 yards, strong side. Plugged him. And I blew the shot at 21 oh, yards no. like a dipshit. No. Oh, no. And it drained the life out of I could have had three bucks and two does on public land in eight sits. And I was like, oh, that's probably like if you guys are sports fans, like there's certain things happen in a game and you're like, man, you're going to want that one back. Yeah. Yeah. I went another seven or eight sits and never had a chance at an antler deer. Yeah. And I thought for sure, I was like, well, if this happened now, I'll kill one gun season. No problem. No. <laughs> oh man. No. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's how I felt in Indiana because I had three tags last year, filled two of them and then stuck that one in Indiana and we couldn't find him. And yeah, that, I, we, I wanted that one back real bad. I, uh, <laughs> that one hurt. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> that well, one yeah. hurt. That one hurt. But there's always next year, oh, right, yeah. boys? We're, we're excited for yeah. this year. The great thing is, is that just adds so much information into what we know for the next year. Well, you know, like what he was talking about, like the the river access and kind of like just jumping up a tree. Yeah. You know that river crossing that we found yeah. and that big tree that yeah, we could just yeah, yeah, shoop. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. My head was already there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't if, wait. If there was one thing I would say, though, when you're looking at trails, uh, especially crossing those ditches, creeks, rivers, whatever, I would look for more faint sign gotcha. than I would the cutout cattle path. Mm -hmm. Every single time I put cams on those, it's high traffic. Therefore, you know, you don't have a bunch of big deer. You got a bunch of does, babies, and little bucks though. Yeah. I get little bucks, does, and babies on them all the time. Yeah. And you'll even notice when you're looking at those hard trails that cruise that top third, if you go like 20 yards below that trail, you'll just barely be able to catch a faint trail. That's big old Mr. Kanish cruising, catching the thermals. Thermals. See, yeah. walk that. So just something to. Hey, that's a good, that's hey. a good, that's a good idea. Honestly, I, uh, I'll, I'll remember that one because the way the terrain is in this particular situation, I think that the deer have to go through there. But it's a good idea to maybe bring a couple of different cameras, and if we throw one on the main trail, and then we can throw one on maybe some side trails that are, because mm -hmm. the it, the bottoms you know not very wide, so I mean everything kind of has to knuckle down into this bottom, and and uh, now that you say that, that's a good idea. We'll bring a couple more cameras, and I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. You ever notice how when you see the big buck, you hear a stick break? Yeah. It's because they're not on the. They just go wherever their nose takes them. Yeah. Wherever they have the advantage. And I mean, almost every time I've seen a big deer, I either have a stick break or if I'm in like a creek or something or near a river or pond or whatever it is using water access, you hear rocks. They're just, they're loud because they're not going where everybody's cut everything out already. And it's, <laughs> it's crazy because it happens a lot. That, that's yeah. a, that's a great point. Uh, that's for anybody listening that that's one to write down in the old notebook, because now that you say that my old man growing up taught me basically everything until I was, you know, old enough to go do it myself. But like when I was younger, I remember my old man saying, if you hear a big stick break in the woods, get ready because nine times out of 10, it'll be a big buck. And like when I was a kid, I was always like, ah, yeah. You're, you're crazy, Dad. <laughs> but now that I've experienced life, he's 100% right. <laughs> when I killed Dude. my biggest buck in Ohio, the reason why I knew he was coming was because I heard him break a stick at like 70 yards. And I looked up, and here he comes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are you doing, old boy? Like, he must have stepped on a, a tree. Because, <laughs> like, yeah. he, I mean, it was a big crack. And I look up. I, I thought maybe somebody was walking in the woods. I look up, and here he comes. I'm like, oh, Oh, grab your boat, son. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I agree, man. A lot of, lot of big buck stories you hear. Everybody's like, I was sitting there and I heard a stick break. Yep. Then here he came. And I'm yep. like, there's something to that. Yeah. There and is. then trying Absolutely. to find these damn deer on public land. And I'm, I'm like, oh, look at this cattle path. Does. Yeah. Look at this cattle path. Yearling buck that I wouldn't. You know, even yeah. give the time of day, like I'm letting him grow, yada, 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 and then kind of put that together. Do you find that, real quick, do you find that changing 
say late October, early November on those beaten trails or do you, do you, do you not see that on in big timber? No, just because, um, they use their nose so efficiently gotcha. that they're cruising it. They're cruising wherever they can catch the scent off of that trail. Similar with a scrape They're they're more often than not going like if you have 10 encounters on your camera at a scrape, yep. there yep. were probably a hundred or more where they cruised 50 to a hundred yards downwind of that scrape uh, or, you know, with a thermal pool, yep. whatever they had checking it. I'm going to try that this year because I heard, I can't remember who somebody was talking about that on a podcast. And I, and I heard that and I'm going to try that this year with the camera on the scrape. They're like, if in exactly like what you said, if you get 10 pictures on that scrape, there was probably 50 or 60 times that that buck just went downwind of the scrape. Mm -hmm. And you know, now that I'm thinking about that, it probably it is probably a hundred percent right. You know, so I'm actually, I've got a couple scrapes in mind that I'm going to put one on the scrape and I'm going to put one 10, 15 yards off of it facing downwind. Um, and see Just what happens cruising through yeah. yeah checking it wind i'm curious to see what happens and i'm gonna, I'm gonna try it this yeah. year so it's it's the same exact reason why you would you know if you go on you're going in blind why you would hunt the downwind side of a cedar thicket or something like that he's not you know the three-year-old and the yearlings they're going to dive into the cedar thicket and yeah, just push everybody go, around you yeah. go ape shit yeah mm -hmm. and big boy you know it's old bull young bull he's just going to walk the downwind side and nope none of them are ready Next thicket. Yeah. Yeah. It makes Efficiency. a lot of sense. Yep. Yep. Energy sense. conservation. Yeah. Yep. I love it. Well, we're an hour into this and I know you're on vacation and we want to be, <laughs> we yeah. want to be cautious of your time. Um, I appreciate it. I, uh, I know after this conversation that we're going to have to have you on again because I could go down so many rabbit holes <laughs> and we could talk for hours. Yeah. But, I love it. But for, for the time being, we want to say thank you. We want to let yes. you get back to your family. So we'll wrap it up. And uh, Kev's it. got one more question for you, and then yeah, before we get into that, why don't you give the listeners, a, you know, if you got social media where they can find you, at, where they can follow you, plug yourself, yeah, plug yourself, sure. And then we'll plug we'll, away. We'll close so with the we we run a Facebook group where this kind of all started, um, called Fueled by the Outdoors. It's for outdoorsmen. It's not just whitetail hunting, although it is very deer hunt heavy. We've got about twenty two thousand members, I think. Um, so love to have you guys join that. We have a podcast that's also fueled by the outdoors and a YouTube channel. We do hunts, gear reviews, fishing trips, anything. We're ate up with all of it. And then uh, we actually run a trade show for deer hunters called the Mobile Hunters Expo. And we have our last show of the year in Kalamazoo, Michigan, July 28th through 30th. And uh, essentially that's just a, a show with a bunch of um, you know, saddle and stand stick companies that, uh, we, we get them all together and you can come try gear before you buy it. Oftentimes you get a discount. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a way to be able to try all that expensive higher end mobile hunting gear and, you know, kind of get advice and tips and tricks from not only the people who make it, but people who are unbiased and don't care if you buy it or not, they just want to help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, it's, it's a really great way to be able to buy gear. And then we also have hunting seminars and stuff. And I, I'd like to say I hang my hat on, um, you know, the people that are speaking at these shows are certified grade A killers. Um, and it's just, it's so cool because you get together with all these people and it's like a giant deer hunting camp. And, and a lot of us have, have seen and talked to each other on social media and, you, you know, you go in and you want some advice on X and then you stood and talked to a dude for two hours and 30 minutes about, you know, your deer story. You know, we've all done it. So, yeah. um, you know, you kind of nerd out on gear and everything. And it's a really good time. So love to see some people come out and try out some gear, buy it if they want and check out some seminars. You can try out e-bikes. I mean, the, the works. So, but uh, guys, I really appreciate you having me on here. I'm I'm honored to to be on a fellow Ohio boys hey, podcast yeah, and hey, uh, appreciate it. I hope we do it again. Love to have you guys on ours as well. Yeah. Let's yeah, schedule absolutely. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, All right. Okay. So the, fi the final question we have, and we didn't even get into our icebreakers. It just rolled out. We so just good, rolled so it. We didn't need the icebreakers. We'll save those for next time. Yeah. <laughs> so the final question we have is 
what has hunting taught you that you can use in your everyday life? <laughs> Grit. There you go. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that give up on a lot of things and could probably be great, but they just don't keep going when things get really hot, mm -hmm. hard. Cause like, for example, I'm kind of a believer. So forgive me here. I don't want to shove this down people's throats, but no, so, you're, you're amongst believers here as well. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, Jesus talks about love. It's like the most preached thing in the Bible. Right. So, um, we often kind of misconstrue what love really is. And for, I don't know if you guys are old enough. I don't know how old you are, but I'm 39 and there used to be, I want to say it was a Gatorade commercial back in the day. And, and the theme of it was love hurts and it, you know, the song love hurts. Yeah. Yep, so, yep. and it's just showing people getting murdered on the football field and yep. you name it. <laughs> Uh, getting hard fouls in basketball and and then it shows them getting up and kind of rising to the occasion so many times with hunting things don't go your way i don't know a human being out there that goes through life or hunting and everything's just like oh well i'm perfect and this was perfect and the end nobody would give a shit about that story anyways mm -hmm. that's not interesting right so when you learn to persevere uh, in hunting, it really helps you in life, I believe, because when you're out, you know, in Nebraska dealing with 110 degree days and you get on a deer and make a shot day six, you know, and day seven you're leaving or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, there's nothing better than a good struggle, a good fight, and then you end up coming out on top. And sometimes, you know, like my Indiana story I just told, sometimes you screw it up and you don't come out on top. Yeah. But that kind of stuff, you know, you can either let it get you down and you can be a little baby and make excuses. And I could blame my bow and everything, but it was me. I screwed it up. Yeah. And now yeah. I'm going to personally pin Indiana's legs behind its ears this week <laughs> or this year. So uh, that I would say grit hands down uh, oh, would like be that. what I've learned from hunting. I like that answer. That's yeah. a fast answer too. You already had that picked out. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I didn't know the question, but, <laughs> no, but I, it, know, I, I, I think about it so much, man. Um, talking to the guys that I hunt and hang out with. I mean, I'm like the least tough out of all of them. They are so <laughs> They are badasses and I hate it because <laughs> it used to be, you know, I was like sort of, you know, we all have our cliques and um, I was like the the tougher guy. And now I'm the little fat guy trying to keep up with everybody. <laughs> so, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, sweet. Well, we appreciate you coming on and uh, thanks for, I really enjoyed this one and we just want to say thank you and go back and enjoy your family. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I appreciate it, boys. Yep. Thank you. And uh, let's, Let's talk again soon. Hope to see you at the show, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kalamazoo. Yeah, well, we might think about it. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good, man. Well, All thank right. you, gentlemen. Yep, thank you. Okay, doesn't matter what you've done in the past. You can always be born again, and born again is out. Peace. Peace.